you cannot discount how much work it is. And I, I really do. I say that, and I'm a worker bee. I, I love being busy. I just love making stuff and working all the time. But it's a, it's an exceptional amount of art. I mean, I've been so lucky over the last three years to interview a ton of art licensing and service pattern industry experts, and I am still creating those interviews, but I've also been going through my old interviews and picking out some of my favorite parts, and I've been calling this series Interview Gems, and today I have a clip from a longer interview with Nicole Tamron, and Nicole is a very, very talented watercolor artist who makes her living all through art licensing, and that is not an easy thing to do these days. So we discuss what that really looks like for her, what her design days are like and how she made that transition from her full-time work into art licensing and she really describes what it takes the type of commitment it takes to have a career that is fully funded by art licensing i also want to note that this was recorded a while back and the sound on nicole's end isn't ideal, but this information is too valuable to miss. So I hope you'll bear with us. So take a look at this awesome clip and then check out Nicole's work in the link below. So one reason that I'm totally in awe of your career is because from what I can tell, I think you make most of your, your money from art licensing specifically. And that is some unicorn magic because as I talk about all the time, I really don't make that much money from licensing. Um, most of my art income comes from freelancing. And then in the last year, starting a big course. Now I, I also make money from, from selling courses, but the bulk of my art income has always been freelancing. So do you, well, first question is, do you do any sort of like commissions or freelance work at all? Or is it really genuinely it's all, all licensing? It's all licensing, but uh, it let, made me laugh when you said it's like, you know, print magic. it really isn't magic at all. It's the fact that I no, it is no, Nicole. It's, incorrect. <laughs> it's not, I would tell you why. It's, it's not. It's the fact that, so I have always thought of like Unicorn Magic as anybody that was able to make their full-time income through their artistic career pursuits versus like analytical ones. Because I had always, I have the right left brain thing going on. Me and too, I always me, yeah. made my money from that other side. And so, you know, to me, that's been the goal, right? How do you support yourself with your creative talent? So this is where the magic just completely disappears. Every single ounce of time and energy and research and piece of art I was making was all directed at one industry. So it's kind of that idea of all the eggs in the one basket, which, you know, really funny. I, I don't know that that's necessarily the best idea in the same way that I don't think it's really great to go to Surtech having not talked to anyone in the industry before you drop money on it. Like, right? It's just, it's what I did. So because of that, and one piece of advice that was given really early on is that the amount of art licensing income that you will make is directly related to the amount of art you produce in a year. And that includes if you have a sick kid or if you have to take care of a family member, whatever makes your art production goes down, your income will also go down. Now for me, I 100% had no income coming from art. So it's a very clear line to say, Every dollar has come from art licensing because I didn't have any art income coming outside of that. So 100% of my time, energy, and focus goes into art licensing. 100% of my time, energy mounts from an income from that. Now, the really cool thing that's happened for me over the past 10 years is I've met so many amazing people that licensing is a portion of their income. But guess what? They're coming from other places. They're coming from children's books or um editorial or they're already doing stuff with fashion they're doing quilting they're sewing they're like there's all different things that for me at this stage I find very difficult to add it because what happens is for time to go to those I will take it away from art licensing and then therefore my income will go down with art licensing and would need to shift so I think what you'll really find is it's less magic and more math that where your time is going is going to be split between a variety of creative pursuits where you make a variety of creative income sources. Or what I've done, which is the all the eggs in the basket approach, which is 100% in, 100% out. 
So it did take a number of years to have that transition. And I worked full time doing a non art job while that happened. But one of the greatest, like, I think one of the things I was most proud of myself for was when I was able to match and then out earn my non art income. To me, that's where I crossed the threshold of I'm making income from my yeah, I mean, 100 percent validating. So yes, that's like something that I'm ask artists all the time is like, how long did it take you? So so how as long as we're there, when you were at Surtex, you were still working a full time job. 100. percent In addition to that, I was working a part time job so that I could pay for Surtex because I'm a huge like no debt person. So I yeah, I've been a licensed optician for 21 almost 22 years. Love it. I I knew that, but I forgot that. So I love that. It's like a weird fun fact for like a pull out of parties. So I would take all of the income from that part-time job, which I did, you know, five hours a week. And I would take every dollar and that went into my surtax fund. And so was, when, okay. So part-time job, full-time job, when were you and, creating art? Oh, I actually, I slept for about three to four hours a night for a good two, year break, maybe two, two, three years. And it's, it's something I can't picture myself doing now. Right. I, I couldn't even think about it, but I think, because again, I like, I went to school for art. When you're motivated and you're excited about it, and I knew it you just do it. Thing. That's the thing. I think it, I knew the sacrifice was worth what I did. And it was a means to an end. And honestly, it was it sustainable? No, it really, really wasn't. But I just, I really had a very clear vision of where I was headed with this. And obviously, I was like overextended, like to do, it was horrible. But, and I remember my husband had said something and it was an interesting concepts I don't know why I didn't think about it but he said there's no way you can work this hard at one thing and have it not happen and so it was just that idea that it was time to sort of let the full-time income go and survive on what I was doing and I to say that though I set myself up really well I basically saved enough to have a year of expenses so I wouldn't need to have a single dollar come in from art licensing and it, it had started to come by the way it's just I didn't need to have it really start coming if nothing happened for a year I was actually okay and that really did a lot for my ability, not only to leave the job, but not go back to the job. And I think that that was what really set me up to kind of go. But yeah, I did it all for longer than I hoped I would have to. But I, it definitely, it took me about, I want to say from from zero dollars to where I was like paying for my my booth. Like I didn't need the part-time job, although I still worked it. But like, you know, I paid for that with my, with my art licensing income. And I would just keep reinvesting that back to back. And I think it really took about three, possibly four years to make the income piece completely replace. And um, another thing Terry used to always say is that art licensing is the best way to become an overnight success in three to five years. Have you ever heard that one? <laughs> so, yeah, and it's, it's really very, very true is that you work so hard. And, you know, I remember like my fourth or fifth year at Surtex, I had companies that were like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Where have you been? And I'm like, here, then here every, every year, year. <laughs> so, you know it really is that and then the other interesting thing is um you know switching platforms from being on my own to working with my agents it also took about that three year period not to like make back where I was it's not like that but it took three years to really start getting in a groove with their clients and there that's a whole nother platform so that three year mark I think is so important for people to understand that it's not an instant game and um even when I signed up for my first Surtex show, in my mind, I was not signing up for one show. I was signing up for three. And I ended up being there for five. So, you know, it's really something that takes a considerable amount of time. And, you know, that's time past the research kind of production time. So that's why I'm such a big fan of, like, start. Because it's still going to be three to five years from when you start. Yeah. Not learning. I know. I well, learned so another trajectory. When I started with licensing, it was 2013 and I started by looking for agents. And so Jewel is my, Jewel Branding and Licensing is my current agent. And so I was talking to their artists at the time. And basically at that time, they were pretty much only like three years old, four years old, basically of an yeah. agency. So when I talked to the artists, they were all at that tipping point. They were like, it's been a long ride. Like it's slow. It's hard, but three, like now it's three years now it's coming. So just know that it's going to take that time. Yeah. So yeah. I like went very hard my first two or three years creating all these new collections. And I'm like, I created all this, where is the payoff? And then, you know, the payoff still wasn't where I wanted. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, 
then I started to have more traction with freelance. And so I did put, you know, it's interesting that you're saying like, it wasn't magic. It's just that I was only focusing on licensing. And, and I guess my attention drifted and because I had already done all this and I'm like, you know, you keep hearing, you make your licensing portfolio and you can reuse it forever. And like, I knew that that wasn't totally true. Of course you have to come up with new stuff, but I'm like, now I have like 70 collections that haven't been licensed because I have 90 collections and maybe 20 of them have been used all the, and some various bits and pieces, but that's the thing. It's like, I have so much art that hasn't been used. So I'm like, why am I going to make more? Like I get like new trends and what people are asking for. I do understand that, yeah, but also a, I'm a, like, I mean, it is, it's so much work. And it's interesting that you said like at that three year mark, like every three years, I tend to have a complete meltdown of this isn't working. I'm wasting my time. And like, I basically implode. But here's the thing. I think this is what's kept me kind of getting back up. I don't have experience in other places, right? Like I don't have the freelance clients to lean back in. I don't have teaching as my background. Like, I What I have is like, do I want to go back to being an optician? Like, Heck no, like that's not <laughs> happening. So yeah, I pick myself up every three years because I do think that there's some growth that happens every three years, but just before the growth, we have this complete second guessing of ourselves that's like, is it going to happen at all? Is it going to turn at all? And that's a really difficult place to get through. And I think it's an important thing to talk about because there was no point there. I was just like, oh, I did Surtex and then I'm an art licensing artist. And, I, and like kind of, that's the abbreviated story, but it took so, and it's, it's continued to do that. Yes, so. I know. And that's me too. You know, like, it's like, I get so impatient. You look back and you're like, okay, sure. But I feel like there's this famous quote, or maybe it's like a graphic I saw something basically where you're tunneling and tunneling and tunneling. And you're like one step away from coming out the other side and you don't know it yet. So you're like, I just did all that. Forget it. And you quit. Yeah, like, yeah no, that's a very famous story. I think of a family that was like digging for gold in California or oil or something. And they end up selling the whole company and the company that buys it finds it like a foot first. <sighs> Like it's, it's actually very like, yeah, there, well there we go yeah so but that's the whole that's thing that's, and that's what it is it's we like, all go through it it's the thing we all go through those moments of you know and because I, I you cannot discount how much work it is and I, I really do I say that and I'm a worker bee I, I love being busy I just love making stuff and working all the time but it's a, it's an exceptional amount of art I mean I actually am so completely like I sometimes when I do teach we have like sophomores and juniors and then sometimes seniors and the seniors are looking to put together a portfolio of what is it 12 to 16 pieces and you think oh okay <laughs> like you know I, I'm it's sure a place to start to pitching yourself like, yeah yeah you're just like oh my gosh I do that in like a couple weeks like I mean my portfolio is just it's it's amazing the amount that you produce but it's also amazing the amount that is consumed by the industry and I think that that's one of those things that's really interesting is that we always say like is there room for everybody and it's just like they just need so much art and it's because yeah. it doesn't stay on the shelves like you and I I think both missed that heyday of licensing I don't even know what that was about but yeah I mean I've heard of it <laughs> you know, I've heard it like the <laughs> the rumor but like you don't make a collection to make twenty thousand dollars that just doesn't happen now and so I think because of that, like I place an exceptional amount of art, it, it's, but it doesn't earn a ton. If you look at any one of these contracts, and I think this has been a big learning lesson for me is I always have to look at my collective for the year because if I look at any singular industry or any singular contract, you're never going to get that contract and say, yep, that was worth it. It's not. None of them are. And so I think it's just one of those lessons that you have to learn and it's because it's like that, and I am that kind of all or nothing person, I have to do this in a holistic kind of way where I look at it and I say all of the art, all of the kind of creative generation I'm doing over the year is netting this amount of money. And that makes sense. So that's where I think a lot of people get discouraged and licensing is that, like I said, you're going to put a lot of time and effort in. And, you know, sometimes people do hit it and it's great. But um, the majority of the times that's not going to be the case. And you have to look at it again as this group mentality of what did that collection earn do you have kind of stats or an idea ballpark like how many pieces of art or collections or you know do you do each year do you think or each month let's how about each month is that easier to <laughs> break it down like so so um it's interesting because it's changed from the time I started so like 
I don't know. I just, I started with just things I was attracted to and made. And of course, like I talk about pieces that were never licensed. Like I have this whole like Victorian hat pin collection with like hats and hat stands. Cause I was like convinced steampunk that was going to be like my solution to steampunk, like never went on anything, but you know, it's, it's like, I just made stuff and that's kind of the starting point. Now what I do is it's kind of a mix. Um, I would say they're collections I come up with on my own, but they're actually not. I, I have like themes and ideas and sometimes I'll have like icons I'll sketch out or paint, but I tend to not push play on any of those until I start to see client needs start to come in, whether it's trend boards or you know something, or I'll have something that's like kind of, I don't know, it's just like fuzzy over here. And then I'll see something that I'll be like, okay, no, that's a good direction for this grouping. And then I will use that as a catalyst to start it. So I usually do that twice a year. I'll release collections in July and January. And those correspond, of course, with um, Gift Mart in Atlanta. So those two times a year, I'm putting out groups that were not technically requested from somebody, but they definitely were. They started. You were, th- you were thinking about them because yeah, they of. started somewhere. Um, so, so is that like two or three collections you release at a time or like how much? <laughs> So this January, I just released, uh, I think I released 10 collections. So I did Good Lord. Five Christmas and five every day. I don't tend to do as much in July, but then you never really know. So I also probably will do a grouping for Christmas and I'll do a grouping of every day. And then the rest of the time is split into specific client requests. And that's actually a really interesting stage. They're requesting it now from court. And they want your specific style in your hand. So they're calling you to say. So so it's more request based. So it's really just like having freelance clients only instead of getting paid by the hour or the project, I'm getting paid with a guaranteed license. Um, But when I do those projects, because sometimes they could be singular, because we know that single pieces of art might just be fine for certain clients. At that time, because again, I'm very all or nothing, I usually will paint all of the elements and plan out an entire collection. Because at the end of the day, again, take your two steps back. I know that collections place better in multiple categories if they have all the parts and pieces. I will take the time at that stage to paint for the whole grouping. And then I will basically turn that into a full collection. You know, that client's only picking out one piece of that. So I I basically, it's it's a lot more, I do not need to, it takes way more time to do it that way on the front end. So that's why I think sometimes my deadlines feel tighter than they actually are. But on the back end, and this is where I always shine, I keep saying it when I say fulfilling needs and being able to fill holes, that's how I'm able to do that, is I already have these parts and pieces ready to go. I just haven't maybe mobilized them yet. Mm-hmm. And that, that's the secret sauce in terms of like filling client needs, especially when you're a traditional artist, because there's a fair amount of art that's that time, then there's the computer time, then there's the design time. So if I can circumvent a couple of those steps, I'm in a much better position to do what seem like miracles overnight or actually mm-hmm. not. They just have to do with the way I've structured my day and, you know, how I've kind of, but I always, 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 I try very, very hard not to have singles floating out there because singles for me, beyond that one project, they go in the trash. And what I already know is that a single image isn't going to be worth my time for the amount of money. So I always try to think about that in those terms. 